This week on the Green Left News podcast, Israel starves Gaza, students strike for Palestine, and the Mardi Gras parade hits Sydney. This podcast was recorded on stolen land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Isaac Nellis and I'm excited to bring you the latest news for this week. And we'll kick it off with the Palestine Solidarity Movement with thousands marching across the country on March 2 and 3 in wake of Israel's massacre of more than 100 starving Palestinians who are trying to get flour from an aid truck southwest of Gaza City. Israel's siege on Gaza has stopped Palestinians from accessing food, medical supplies, water and other crucial aid. And a United Nations report found that more than 90% of the population, which is more than 2 million people, are facing starvation and malnutrition. This has been made worse by the cutting of funding to the UN Relief and Works Agency, or UNRWA, which is the main organisation providing aid to Gaza, and Western governments cut aid after Israel claimed UNRWA staff were involved in the October 7 incursion, And Labor has refused to restore the funding to UNRWA, despite Foreign Minister Penny Wong conceding that she has not seen any evidence to support Israel's allegations. Green Senator Larissa Waters told the March 3 rally in Mianjin or Brisbane that our government has suspended funding to UNRWA, when instead it should be restoring and increasing it. She said Wong is not taking serious action to stop Israel's genocide. The Mianjin rally had a Solidarity with Palestinian Women theme, in recognition of International Women's Day on March 8. And protesters also held a minute's silence for United States Air Force service person Aaron Bushnell, who self-immolated on February 25 in protest of the US government's participation in genocide. Some positive news is that a YouGov survey found that more than 80% of Australians support an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, which shows that the solidarity movement is cutting through the establishment media's messaging. In Gadigal or Sydney, Edie Shepherd from the Zedek Collective, which is an anti-Zionist Jewish group, said that the global Jewish community must stand with Palestinians. But I do believe the global Jewish community must act now to rise up against the dominant Zionist frameworks that wield hate, fear, power and militarism. Australia Palestine Advocacy Network President Nasser Mashni told the rally in Garamilla or Darwin that Israelis and Zionists want to kill Palestinians, while Palestinians simply want to end the genocide, occupation and colonisation. Kulumbirigan Dangalaba Tiwi woman Milama May drew links between the colonial violence faced by Indigenous people in Australia and Palestine. She said First Nations people live in the same state and under the same violence as Palestine. It just manifests itself in different ways. And kite flying events for Gaza were held in Karatha in Western Australia and Mullabimba or Newcastle over March 2 and 3 with kids making kites decorated with Palestinian flags, watermelons and Free Palestine written on them, in solidarity with the children of Gaza. Pilbara for Palestine organiser Chris Jenkins told Green Left that the action demonstrated once again that support for Palestine exists from the CBD to the bush. At the Mullabimba event, former Green Senator Lee Rhiannon, who visited Palestine in June last year, said that the Israeli occupation impacts everything that Palestinians do. She said one of the common things that people we interviewed said was please take our voice to the world. Hundreds of school and university students across the country walked out of their classrooms for the National Student Strike for Palestine on February 29 demanding an end to the Albanese government's support for genocide. Make no mistake, this is not a war. This is not a conflict. This is not a complicated issue. This is a genocide. (laughs) This is a massacre and it is shocking and it is us to you who need to prove that to our own government. Shame. Shame. We're striking from our school today because we're sick and tired of being complicit in genocide um, and we're 
these uh, voices with all these incredible people um, to speak out against gender. Students at the University of Queensland are speaking out against the university's collaboration with military contractors Boeing and Lockheed Martin. At the student strike on February 29, students marched to the Boeing Centre on campus and pointed out that Boeing is one of the top suppliers of the Israeli military, providing fighter jets and GDAM guidance kits for bombs. Boeing has operated a joint research facility with the University of Queensland at their St. Lucia campus since 2017. Activists say the university is essentially funneling young adults to work for one of the world's weapons companies. Hundreds of social and community workers in Victoria took unprotected strike action in support of Palestine on February 22. They rallied outside the Victorian Council of Social Services and marched to the Federation of Community Legal Centres. It followed an open letter signed by more than 500 workers demanding that community and not-for-profit organisations take a stand against Israel's genocide in Gaza. The strike was organised by Australian Services Union Members for Palestine. And the Jewish Council of Australia has concerned for the safety of Palestinians fleeing Gaza after Sky News said it would release the personal details of 500 people with visas, 81 of whom are in Australia. It said it is alarmed that some Jewish organisations have been lobbying for the Australian government to refuse entry to people seeking safety from Gaza and are pushing anti-Palestinian racism to do so. The Jewish Council of Australia said on January 27 that the assertion that Australia accepting Palestinians fleeing unprecedented violence is in any way a threat to the safety of Jewish people was wrong. Dr Max Kaiser, who's a historian and an executive officer of the Jewish Council, said on Jan 27 that the rhetoric directed against Palestinian refugees is reminiscent of the same rhetoric used to vilify Jewish refugees in the 1940s and 50s who were frequently labelled security risks. This rhetoric is also part of a long history of racism and exclusion in Australia, from the white Australia policy to panics about so-called boat people. And as we reported on last week, right-wing and establishment media organisations went into a frenzy after hearing that Palestinian resistance fighter Leila Khaled has been invited to speak at the Eco-Socialism 2024 conference in Borloo or Perth on June 28-30. And conference organiser Sam Wainwright has responded to the Zionist campaign in an interview with Green Left's Alex Bainbridge. There's two things to say about that hijacking. One is it was 50, well, three things. One was it 50 years ago. Two, she, she did jail time for them. And three, the fact that, that she did that in a moment in the Palestinian liberation movement cannot lead us to then exclude her and say, well, she's a terrorist and therefore we can't hear from her forever. You can listen to the full interview with Wainwright, plus our two interviews with Leila Khaled herself, right here on the podcast feed or on the Green Left website. Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras Parade on March 2 featured strong solidarity with Palestine. Two contingents, Pride in Protest and Rainbow Rebellion, chanted pro-Palestine chants and held Palestinian flags and placards. An estimated 300,000 people watched the annual parade down Oxford Street or on the ABC live stream, and the chants of ceasefire now received a lot of support from the crowd. One Pride in Protest activist had been arrested by New South Wales police before the rally for allegedly carrying dangerous screws, and eight Palestinian solidarity activists were arrested after jumping the fence in front of the Labour Party float, where New South Wales Premier Chris Minns was marching and unfurling a Queers for Palestine banner. There was a bit of contention around uh, the Mardi Gras parade this year, as despite much opposition from the community, New South Wales police again joined the march. The Mardi Gras board initially asked New South Wales police not to march after Senior Constable Beau Lamar Condon allegedly shot Jesse Baird and Luke Davies with his police-issued gun on February 19. A photograph of Lamar Condon marching in uniform at the 2020 parade quickly went viral. However, the Mardi Gras board bowed to the pressure from Police Minister Yasmin Catley 
Premier Chris Minns, Sydney MLA Alex Greenwich and Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, among others, and allowed the police to march in plain clothes. The police actually ended up marching in matching navy blue shirts, flanked on either side by fully uniformed riot squad officers. Uh, the grassroots LGBTIQ rights group Pride in Protest has been campaigning for police to be blocked from marching in Mardi Gras since 2018 because of the force's history of brutality towards queer people, First Nations people and other minorities. And a lot of people have already pointed out that the first Mardi Gras in 1978 was a protest against police violence towards the LGBTIQ community. About 300 people joined a Pride in Protest organised snap rally at Taylor Square on Oxford Street on 1st of March, which was the day before the parade, calling for the ban on police to be reinstated. After protesters occupied part of Oxford Street, police surrounded protesters, shoving and threatening the use of guns and pepper spray. And an anti-war organisation came together to organise a protest outside Business Illawarra's Defence Industry Conference at the Shell Harbour Civic Centre in Tharawal or Wollongong on March 1st. Wollongong Friends of Palestine and Wollongong Against War and Nukes came together to protest the Defence Conference, which was attended by Minister for Defence Industry Pat Conroy and Assistant Treasurer Stephen Jones, as well as representatives of weapons and security companies. Protesters highlighted the links between these businesses and the war on Palestine. And Victoria's Voluntary Assisted Dying Review started last July, assessing the first four years of the VAD Act, which was implemented in 2017. Dying with Dignity Victoria said in its submission there was an urgent need for legislative review. It said too many people are not having their needs met in a system that is not compassionate or timely for many. Its submission was based on feedback over several years from people seeking VAD and their families and carers, doctors and other health professionals with whom we interact. Jane Morris, who's the Dying with Dignity Victoria president, told Green Left that some issues limiting access to VAD cannot be addressed without legislative change. It is critical that a full review of the legislation is scheduled as soon as possible, giving no further review is mandated in the current Act. Now let's hear what's happening around the world. On February 25, Aaron Bushnell became the first active duty United States soldier to use self-immolation to protest the actions of the military he was a part of. In a self-recorded message outside the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C., he said, I'm about to engage in an extreme act of protest, but compared to what people have been experiencing in Palestine at the hands of their colonizers, it's not extreme at all. This is what our ruling class has decided will be normal. He then lit himself on fire, later succumbing to his injuries in hospital. Before his final act of protest, Bushnell, who worked in the IT department in the US Air Force, made a post on Facebook which said, Many of us would like to ask ourselves, what would I do if I was alive during slavery, or the Jim Crow South, or apartheid? What would I do if my country was committing genocide? The answer, he said, is you're doing it right now. Anti-imperialist and Palestine solidarity organizations within the US have released several statements in honor of Bushnell. Brian Becker, who's the executive director of the Act Now to Stop War and End Racism Coalition, or the ANSWER Coalition, wrote in a statement released on the morning of February 26 that this was an act of martyrdom by a US service member who was outraged by the actions of a government that speaks in his name. The Palestinian youth movement said in making the most extreme sacrifice a human being can in support of a moral cause, his own life, Aaron sent a message on behalf of the masses of the US and of the world that people of conscience everywhere will refuse complicity in the unfolding genocide against the Palestinian people until our last breath. The weight of Bushnell's protest, including the fact that he was an active member of the US military, sent shockwaves around the world. 
with Washington, Aaron Bushnell and his last words, Free Palestine, appearing as trending topics on X or Twitter. The video was also widely shared in Yemen, Lebanon and amongst Palestinians around the world. Meanwhile, Israel is continuing its assault on Gaza, launching drone strikes on the small city of Rafah as it prepares for a ground assault. It is also continuing to impose its starvation regime on Gaza, with more than 90% of the population starving without access to food. Other horrible figures include 90% of children under the age of 5 having one or more infectious diseases, 70% suffering from diarrhoea, 81% of households having less uh, having access to less than a litre of water per person per day. And of the six measures ordered by the International Court of Justice, um, one of them was to take immediate and effective measures to protect the Palestinian populace in Gaza from risk of genocide by ensuring the supply of humanitarian assistance and basic services. And it is clear that Israel is not following this order. The ICJ's regional director for the Middle East and North Africa Heba Moraev said, Not only has Israel created one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world, but it is also displaying callous indifference to the fate of Gaza's population. Since the ICJ order, the number of aid trucks entering Gaza has declined. Within three weeks, it had fallen by a third. An average of 146 uh, trucks a day were coming. And then three weeks later, the numbers had fallen to about 105. Israeli settler groups have also taken to protesting and blocking aid from entering Gaza, and Israel is barely attempting to hide its genocidal ambitions. New Zealand's government is ignoring all this and has instead declared that Hamas is a terrorist entity at a time when millions of people are marching worldwide for an immediate ceasefire and lasting peace in Palestine. It would have been more realistic and just to condemn Israel for its genocidal war and five months of atrocities. And New Zealand activist John Minto pointed out that Palestinian resistance movements have the right, under international law, to take up arms to fight against their colonial occupiers, just as the African National Congress, or ANC, and Nelson Mandela had the right to take up arms to fight for freedom in apartheid South Africa. The right to self-determination includes the right to choosing your own representatives, including Hamas, an Islamist nationalist independence and resistance movement, which is defending its illegally occupied territory, and not a terrorist movement as the US and Israel would like the world to believe. Like New Zealand, Australia is strongly supporting Israel both politically and materially, and contributing weapons components and money to the genocidal state, as well as freezing aid to UNRWA. This has led to a group of lawyers referring Prime Minister Anthony Albanese Foreign Minister Penny Wong and op Opposition Leader Peter Dutton, along with other senior members of the government, to the International Criminal Court for their support for genocide. The coordinated string of strike actions brought Finland to a standstill from February 12 to 16, when more than 130,000 workers took action in response to an array of neoliberal reforms proposed by Conservative Prime Minister Pateri Orpo and his National Coalition Government. These reforms intended to brutally wind back the country's welfare system and severely restrict trade union activity. Transportation, healthcare, childcare and education workers walked off the job on February 12, followed by industrial workers and office workers on February 14. And then on February 15, electrical and energy workers downed tools across the country, followed by food distribution workers. This was the latest in an ongoing campaign of political and industrial action that began last year after the Orpo government announced in July it would implement neoliberal reforms to industrial relations and welfare. The dispute is an ideological clash between working people and a neoliberal government determined to dismantle Finland's Nordic model of industrial relations and welfare. Women in Raqqa took to the streets on March 3rd to kick off a week of events to mark International Women's Day on March 8th, demonstrating the city's resilience in the face of challenges. The march celebrates not only the global significance of the day, 
but also the remarkable transformation of Raqqa from an Islamic state or ISIS stronghold to a symbol of hope and change. The celebrations reflect a commitment to gender equality and women's empowerment that is deeply rooted in the broader context of what is known as the Rojava Revolution and the Kurdish-led autonomous administration in North and East Syria. Marches, seminars, workshops and cultural performances are celebrating women's achievements but also reaffirming the commitment to a democratic, inclusive, egalitarian society, paving the way for a future where gender equality is not just an ideal, but a lived reality. You can read more about all of the stories we talked about today, plus videos, detailed analysis, and book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please become a Green Left supporter today from $5 a month and donate to our 2024 Fighting Fund to help us continue reporting on workers, climate and social justice movements. Go to greenleft.org.au forward slash support to help us out. Your support is greatly appreciated. And as always, head to the activist calendar at greenleft.org.au forward slash events to find out about upcoming protests, rallies, forums, cultural events and more happening in your town and city. Thanks to Sean Balanswala for the music you heard in this podcast. You can find his work by going to at Little Archer Beats or clicking the link in the description. And remember to follow at Green Left online on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Threads and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. If you could also give this show a five-star rating on whatever uh, program you're listening to this on, that would be really appreciated. And share around with your friends. Thanks for listening.